Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you are new here. I am back today with another true crime case because it's True Crime Tuesday, so it makes sense. The case that I'm doing today is something that's really, really weird. Like, as it goes on, you kind of just like, how did that even happen? But anyway, I will get into that. This is the case of Ira Einhorn sometimes known as the unicorn killer. And that's literally just because his surname translates to one horn and that's what unicorns have, just the one. So he's a, he's a unicorn killer. And he was a killer because he eventually got convicted of murdering his ex-girlfriend, Holly Maddox. So a bit about Ira Samuel Einhorn. He was born on the 15th of May, 1940 to a middle-class Jewish family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in the early 1960s and he became extremely involved in anti-war movements and he was very into like ecological activism. He was just very much interested in getting his point across about these kind of things. He was very much known around the whole of Philadelphia for his beliefs because he would hold protests and rallies and get people together in big groups and get up in front of everybody and do speeches. He was he was really well known around the area. He led a lot of anti-Vietnam War protests around his city and he would do these speeches and have people completely hooked and listening to every word that he was saying. Even if not everybody necessarily agreed with what he was saying, he was the kind of person that you would stop and listen to. He was very like captivating in that kind of way. He was charming, persuasive. He was just very influential. He was like the ultimate like head hippie to look up to. He was really rugged. He had a massive beard. He was a bit like unkempt. He had really, really bright blue eyes. He was just the kind of person that would really draw you in. You were really keen to get to know him, like look at him. He was just quite, what's the word? I don't know. He was just quite intriguing. Is that the word? Maybe. <laughs> he was basically like a local celebrity around Philadelphia. He was always ahead of a trend. So when one thing would stop and the next thing would kind of begin, he would always be at the forefront of that. So like when the peace movement was really prominent, he would be, talking about world peace all the time. Like he was keeping ahead of everything that was happening. He got involved in like every aspect of Philadelphian life. He ran for mayor at one point. He would act as a mediator between like businesses and individuals and even between students of the university and the police when they would clash, he would be a mediator. He just inserted himself into so many different areas and knew so many different people because of this. He spent some time teaching at the university as well. He was academic as well as wanting to sort of get his points across. And it was just like a cool thing for people to have like a an influential hippie around in the 60s and 70s. That was just kind of what people liked. So the university was happy to have him because he was like a an influential figure to have and it just looked cool. So that they were happy to do that. In April 1970 was the first ever Earth Day and Ira went to that. He stood up and did a big speech. He was like one of the speakers of the event. He later said that he was pretty much like the one behind creating the whole thing, but then that was pretty heavily disputed by other organisers. So whether he was involved in the organising, I've got no idea. He said he was, but a lot of people said he wasn't. So I don't know, but he was definitely there. He definitely spoke at it. So we know that much. <laughs> Despite his public persona as being very all about love and not wanting war and just being very like peace and love, he was very arrogant as well and he was quite domineering. He did have a bit of an ego about him and I'm guessing it's just because he spent so long having people like adoring him and hanging on to his every word. I think it just went to his head and then he really started to think a lot of himself. So I'm not really surprised that he ended up that way. I think it was just a bit of a 
power trip because he was really popular. I do find it really weird that he would spend so much of his time advocating for peace and love and non-violence when he was so violent in ex-relationships. Like some of his exes, one of them he smashed her over the head with a bottle and another one he tried to strangle and yet he would be stood up in front of people talking about how important it is to like not fight and to just love and like peace and love. And then he would strangle his girlfriend. Like it just doesn't make any sense. But he was very much two, two people, I think. In 1972, Ira met Holly Maddox, whose real name I think is Helen, but she went by Holly. So that's what I'll be calling her. She was originally from Texas. She was an absolutely beautiful girl. She had long blonde hair. She used to be a cheerleader. She was academic, she was clever. She was the oldest of five siblings and she had two really loving parents. Ira insisted that their relationship just remain like an open relationship. He was promiscuous, I would say. And he didn't have a problem with discussing his sexual escapades with people. I think even when Holly was around, he just would discuss anything like that. He wasn't just about sticking with one person. Holly and Ira were a little bit on and off again, mainly I think because of the reasons I've just said, like not wanting to just remain the one straight relationship. I think maybe just got to her a little bit. So they were on again, off again, but they did always sort of end up getting back together and they stayed together for around five years. Holly was very involved in the women's liberation movement and because Ira was basically like a political icon at this point, she was really drawn to him and that is ultimately how the two of them ended up meeting, just by attending different rallies and things together. So that is kind of why they ended up like being drawn to each other. People found their relationship quite interesting, like from the outside looking in because she was like a really clean, like groomed, attractive looking young woman and he was just really scruffy and didn't didn't used to like wash. So he was just a bit like, ugh, just, I don't know. They were just pretty opposite. So people used to think it was quite funny, the two of them together because they just looked so different, I guess. But then again, everything's not about looks. A lot of stuff is based on personality and he was a very charming guy and he was very, charismatic so that is what drew her into him I suppose it didn't really matter what he looked like they liked each other for how they were I just thought I'd mention that just because I read it on a couple of things like people saying they were a bit like beauty and the beast kind of thing which is really harsh but I mean he didn't end up being a murderer so I mean kind of feel like I can say that. And it just said it quite a lot of times online, so I just thought I would mention it. <laughs> Despite the fact that he wasn't like holding down like a normal full-time job, he was spending a lot of time organizing these protests and things like that around the city and occasionally I think working at the university. He lived very well. He had a lot of corporate allies who really, really liked him and they would give him money. Just They would just give him money all the time and like gifts and things. So he just kind of just got away with everything just running really smoothly. He was just given things because he knew how to talk the talk. People just liked him being around. So he did really well for himself. But after five years together, Holly realized that she just wanted to go back to having a bit more of a stable, less chaotic life. The kind of life that she had before she got involved with Ira. She just wanted to go back to basics and just go back to a normal, stable, chilled life. So she told him that she wanted to end their relationship and obviously he wasn't happy about that. They would get into really heated arguments all the time because he would kind of try and convince her to stay and she just, she just didn't want to. She wasn't having any of it. She'd already made her mind up. And friends of the couple said that they would bicker all the time about this topic. She just couldn't be persuaded. And she actually ended up moving to New York in 1977 to start her new single life. While she was in New York, she met a guy called Saul Lapidus and they met at a dinner party on Fire Island in New York where she was staying with one of her friends. And they really hit it off at this dinner party and they ended up doing quite a lot of things together. They spent a magical 
couple of weeks together is what Sol described it as. They were even in the middle of planning a two week holiday on Sol's sailboat. That's how like well things were going in such a short amount of time. They were planning this holiday and that was when Sol got a call in his apartment from Ira. Ira had somehow found out about their new relationship and he rang up and basically was threatening Holly to say that all of the belongings that she'd left in his apartment that she shared with him, he was just gonna throw them all out of the window. He was gonna throw her clothes out the window, her driving license, bank records and bank details. He was just gonna chuck them all out of the window. And obviously she didn't want that to happen. She was really concerned about that. So she agreed that she would go back to Philadelphia to get her belongings despite the fact that her family and friends all didn't think it was a good idea, they didn't like the relationship as it was and they didn't want her to go back to see him, they didn't think it was necessary, but she said she had to, it was just something she needed to do, she needed to go back and it would be fine. She told Saul that he was just in one of his moods and that it would be fine and he said, are you sure you don't want me to come with you? I, I'm happy to come with you. And she said, no, 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 I can handle it this has happened before. So she left to go and see Ira on the 9th of September, 1977. But Saul and Holly's family and friends never saw or heard from her ever again. After a little while of nobody hearing from or seeing Holly, they started to get worried, obviously. Saul, her family and her friends were all getting really concerned because they knew that the last place that she was heading was to see Ira. But other than that, there wasn't really a lot for anybody to go on. When they told the police that she was missing, all they really had was that she was going to see him. That was common knowledge. But at this point, Ira was pretty much like a public figure and the police didn't even think to consider him as being a suspect. They, he just wasn't even in the in the picture, they had no intention of him being a suspect. It just didn't cross their minds. He was questioned by the police, I think just obviously because he had to be, and he just said that he'd seen her, she'd come round, but then she left for whatever reason, and then she never came back. And he was pretty busy, so he didn't really have time to think of it, or he never really thought, oh, that's weird, she never came back, because he was a busy guy, so he just thought nothing else of it, and that was, enough to keep the police happy, I guess. The mystery of where Holly was went on for an agonizing 18 months and Holly's family and friends back in Texas were just completely devastated by not knowing what happened to her and where she was. So they took it upon themselves to hire private detectives to help the case along because things just weren't developing as they wanted them to be. Ira's neighbors in the apartments surrounding him started to notice a really, really bad smell coming from there. And obviously this was reported. And as soon as this happened, Ira's alibi just kind of started to not look so credible. Authorities went round to Ira's apartment on the 28th of March, 1979. And when they got there, he answered the door, apparently just completely nude. And he had no problems with them coming in. He didn't resist at all when the authorities went inside and began searching his apartment. They came across a closet inside Ira's bedroom and once they had got into that, once they'd got access into the closet, they found a big steamer trunk, which is just like a big trunk thing that's got a lid on it. And when they opened that, they found the mummified body of Holly Maddox. It was later confirmed that Holly had been bludgeoned to death. Ira was arrested and had a bail hearing after bail was set at $40,000. Because Ira had so many connections and so many people in his life that really bought into him, a lot of people attended the bail hearing, including priests, local company directors, like professors. It was like a really high turnout for this bail hearing. And all of these people obviously really liked Ira. They didn't believe that he would do anything like that. So they all voiced their opinions that he was really gentle and he was all for non-violence and he would never do anything like that. Ira claimed a few different things after Holly's body was discovered, including the fact that he'd actually never seen her since she told him that their relationship was over and that she must have been killed or murdered 
by a secret government conspiracy who were trying to frame him. So she'd been killed by some agents and then while he was out, they brought her body into his apartment and hid it and he had no idea to frame him. And a slightly different variation to that story was when he said that he'd gone into his apartment and found her body, found her dead body just in his apartment and she'd obviously been killed by the CIA or the FBI and they'd left her body there and he panicked thinking that nobody would believe this story so he just hid her body and hoped that it would never come up. Like, how, how do you think that that's logical? I don't know. Anyway, his $40,000 bail was paid for by Barbara Bransman who was a Canadian socialite and she was sort of in with him as everybody else was. And so she paid his bail and his trial was set to start in 1981. But shortly before he was due to appear in court, he fled the country and went to Europe. Ira spent the next 17 years moving around to different places in Europe. He went by the name Eugene Malone and he even ended up getting married during this time that he was away to a woman named Annika. According to the authorities of what they know now, Ira, obviously now going by Eugene, started off in Dublin, Ireland. He then went across to England and then went to Sweden and then ended up lastly in France. Really frustratingly for the investigators, there was times when they were really close to catching him, like they would be about to get him like a few hours off from being able to catch him and then something would end up happening and he'd get away and they'd just miss him by hours and this happened like three times and it was really frustrating. It was as though he was being tipped off by somebody so he kind of knew when to get away but they just, they just missed him a few times and it was super annoying. In 1993, so 12 years after he went on the run, a Philadelphia court tried to try him in absentia which is basically just when the person's like gone missing or they've gone AWOL and you don't know where they are but you want to get the conviction anyway so they do the trial just with like an empty chair and everything goes on as normal but you're just not there to like defend yourself or whatever so they did that and they ended up getting the verdict of guilty but this would actually just complicate things and make things difficult later on in the case, as you will see when I get to it. Then about a year after this, Barbara Branthman, who was the woman who paid his bail, had had a lot of time to think and she was now starting to think that actually maybe he wasn't innocent. And she told the investigators, like that she gave them a tip that they needed to look for him with a woman named Annika Flodin. Now nothing happened for a little while until 1997 when a driver's application form came through for somebody named Annika Flodin Malone. And if you remember, Ira's new name was Eugene Malone. So it seemed as though this was the wife that he had married during his time on the run. On the 15th of May in 1997, investigators managed to get the address that he was living in in southwestern France and so it seemed as though they were finally closing in on Ira. Luckily, he wasn't tipped off or anything, he had no idea what was going to be happening and the French police went round and arrested him so he was finally captured after all of these years. So he was just going to be extradited back to Philadelphia, right? Well, this is where that earlier guilty conviction threw a bit of a spanner in the works for a while. Basically, France has a law that says that if you were tried in absentia, you have to be given a new trial when you've reappeared. So whenever you come back from wherever you were, even though you've had a trial in like done by, you've been tried by absentia, you still have to be given a new trial so that you're able to have the opportunity to defend yourself and speak or whatever you wanna do. But Philadelphia doesn't have that law. So France just refused to extradite Ira because they knew that he wasn't gonna get that opportunity. So they just said no. But the following year in 1998, Philadelphia passed a law that would grant the courts the special power to be able to 
grant new trials in certain cases like IRAs. And since this was passed and everything was a-okay, France decided that it was fine to extradite him back to Philadelphia as long as he also wasn't given the death penalty because that was also following on from their laws. They just basically said that he wasn't allowed to be given the death sentence. That was agreed and he was sent back to Philadelphia, finally. On the 17th of October, 2002, a very long 25 years after first committing the crime, Ira, who was now 62 years old, was given life in prison for first degree murder without the possibility of parole. The district attorney said that it was a sweet day for the Maddox family and for Holly's memory. Ira has always maintained his innocence right up until he passed away in SCI Laurel Highlands Prison in Pennsylvania on the 3rd of April, 2020. So it took a long time. It took a long time of him being on the run for them to be able to get him back into Philadelphia and to finally convict him so that Holly's family could finally get justice. I can't believe how long that took. It's insane that he was away for so many years, like 17 years just on the run. And how did he get, manage to get married during that time? Just blows my mind. I'm so happy that he did manage to serve some time before he passed away because he can't have got away with that. It was just such a horrific crime. And oh, it's just bizarre that so many people would stick by him. A lot of the people who were on his side originally, like the corporate people and the business people that liked him, they were all completely gobsmacked by the fact that they were so like hooked in to him and didn't think he could do that and they just feel like idiots now because of that which I suppose you would. I suppose if you've known someone for a while thinking that they could murder someone I suppose would seem crazy but it does happen as we can see. So that is everything I've got on today's case. If there's anything I've missed and you think that it needs to be included into this video, let me know in the comments because I like to discuss stuff like that with you guys. If there's anything that you think I haven't said, please feel free to let me know. And subscribe if you like this kind of content. Make sure to turn on the bell for notifications, then you'll know as soon as I post. And hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it and I will be back with another video on Saturday. I'll see you then, bye. Oh.